I believe in information. I studied theology, got my master's in theology. I believe in it. I have many theological books, but if theology causes us to increase in information and it doesn't increase the capacity of our heart to burn brightly. Whoa, when we stand before the bridegroom one day, when we stand before Jesus, if our theology did not buy oil, what does that mean, Larry? Buy oil. If our theology did not contribute to us cultivating a deep experiential Bible-based personal relationship interaction with God. Does this make sense to you? If our theology did not contribute to that and we stand before the bridegroom one day, we will not be a burning one because theology and information by itself don't contribute to oil. All right. Do you know why there are people who come every week to the altar? Because they're just being a Bible literalist. And specifically with Romans 12, 1, they're offering up their life as a living sacrifice. If you're going to the altar to get a zing from God, a zap, a zing, woo, wow, zoo, to look spiritual, to get caught up in emotion, if that's the reason you keep going, you need to go buy oil. I say that with a smile. You just need to cultivate relationship with God. It's wonderful to go to a conference to get things ignited. It's wonderful to, to be provoked and Yes, to receive impartation. Impartation, where people lay hands on you, do you know what that's doing? It's not God giving you something new that you don't already have. People will lay hands on you, and I think through the laying out of hands, it actually stirs up what's already on the inside of you. We see Paul saying that to Timothy, stir up the spiritual gifts that have been released to you through the laying on of hands. So there's definitely balance, but there's also imbalance. So my prayer, my invitation to you, prophetic invitation for 2023, this is not just going to happen, by the way. It's not just going to fall in your lap. The invitation, wow, just feel it. I feel the weightiness of the Lord on this. The invitation is that you could go from glory to glory. I'm going to declare it over you. I'm not just going to say it. You can go from glory to glory. In other words, you can increase in proximity to God. You can become completely saturated by the Holy Spirit. I feel it right now. You can become like we read about in the book of Acts, Peter, whose shadow healed the sick. Paul, who they took pieces of cloth and clothing off of his body while he was making tents, put it on the sick and demonized, and they were healed. I always say this. I'm impressed that a shadow healed the sick. I'm impressed that his clothes cast out demons. I'm more impressed and I'm more provoked to know it's possible to be that saturated by God. That's what glory to glory looks like. And it's possible for you to be saturated. How hungry are you for God? Because you're as close to God as you want to be. The invitation is now extended to you. Jesus did everything sovereignly in the work of redemption and atonement because you and I could not possibly accomplish that. But the invitation is to you, my brother, my sister, and it's drawn near to God. He'll draw near to you. 2023, I'm going to give you a bold call, a bold invitation, draw near to God. Push the limits on God. What does that mean? It means draw near to him and see how close he draws near to you. That's what it looks like to buy the oil. I hear the Lord saying, you'll know the season if you're carrying the oil. Just like an engine works on fresh oil, just like an instrument only works when it's freshly oiled, a wineskin can only be used properly when it is supple and freshly oiled. You will need the fresh oil. So in this season, you'll know how to discern what is right from wrong, what to say yes or no to, or what tool that I have for you to use if you are oiled. You must devote this season to prayer and to my presence if you want to know what I am saying. This will be a season when you need to collect oil like a wise virgin. And when you do, you will know exactly which tool to pick up. You will know which company to build with. You'll know what you are building and what is ahead for you. It is a season where it feels counterproductive, but I need you to step into my rest and my refreshing. Allow me to guide you and lead you. Allow me to cut off the fat. Allow me to break the ground beneath you. Allow me to open the doors for this season that the enemy has marked the season with false launches and fake promises. But this season is one that if you get antsy, if you allow anxiety to lead you, you'll break down doors and enter things that are before you and before your time. It'll actually cause what I've planned for you to work against you.
The anointing is the power of Jesus. Jesus who comes in power to destroy, get rid of those yokes, those works of the devil. That's simply what the anointing is. And it says in the Bible that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Jesus is the king of this kingdom. So he's not just a matter of talk, but he's a matter of power. And just talking about Jesus, just talking, saying that Jesus is a healer, is a deliverer, does not get rid of yokes, but actually carrying the power of Jesus, Jesus in his fullness, demonstrating the power of God, releasing the anointing, that's what destroys the yoke. And that is why anointing is necessary and we will die spiritually and physically prematurely without it. We need the anointing. We need the anointing to have victory over the devil. We need the anointing to walk victoriously and have the abundant life that Jesus has provided for us. What is the anointing of God? Based on what little we just heard in the past six and a half minutes, can we have an inkling of a biblical understanding as to what it means to be anointed? We heard from Larry Sparks, a publisher of Destiny Image, concerning a prophetic word for 2023. He titled it A Year of Fire, Oil, and Awe. I will talk a little more about what Larry shared later. What I wanted to highlight now is the focus on the oil of intimacy, as he mentioned. And even in the beginning of that video, he talked about that that particular language or phrase is used by those such as Heidi Baker and Carol are not to, to describe the oil of intimacy. That phrase I'm fam very familiar with as I wrote about um, the oil of intimacy myself several years ago. We also heard a reading of Nate Johnston's prophetic word released seven days ago called The Pursuit of Oil, where he said the Lord was calling for a focus on oil for direction, fellowship, and discernment. Catherine Crick shared in a public gathering months ago why we need the anointing, pointing to victory and walking in power, demonstrating signs and wonders and the abundant life when we have the anointing. In fact, she said we must have the anointing so that we don't spiritually die and physically die. I share these clips because as you and I can tell, talk of oil or the anointing has not changed. There is still a focus at times on the anointing and having fresh oil or being oily or not oily enough. There are words and teachings about receiving an anointing, sitting under an anointing, honoring an individual's anointing, and carrying your own anointing. Today, we will go back in time to look at two of my former prophetic words shared by Charisma Magazine in 2017, talking about oil and the anointing. And if you're not familiar with me doing this from time to time, I don't necessarily enjoy it, but it's a good exercise. I go back and I look at some of the old prophetic words that were published formally on my blog, but no longer available, but I can still dig them up now off Charisma's website. We will look at scripture mentioned by both myself and others to see what the meaning holds. And we will be encouraged as always by the word of God as to what the anointing is. And if you or I lack it as a believer in Christ. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Six Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the word and loving the one who is the word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Six Scribe. Well, as I said earlier, we're going to be looking at a couple of words that I wrote several years ago back in 2017, dealing with oil and the anointing. And as I said, I do this from time to time, not because I enjoy it, but I believe it's only fair for me to look at things that I wrote before and test them against scripture. And so I wanted to do that today. And the first one I'm going to be reading to you and stopping along the way where needed. Most of it is really uh, very vague. To be honest with you, it's word salad. But um, at any rate, the first one had to do with uh, a transformational oil spill is coming. And this was featured uh, in Charisma on their website in 2017. I, I believe it was in February of 2017. So here we go. On a recent morning while in prayer, I heard the words oil spill clearly in my spirit. There has been a lot of prophetic talk about oil and what God wants to do in this coming season. And I believe this is an extension of what I am hearing in my spirit. 
Oil represents the anointing of the Lord. It represents the Holy Spirit. Oil was used to anoint the priest for service in the Old Testament. Oil was poured onto the heads of kings by prophets so as to anoint them for their royal assignment. Okay, we know that that's in scripture. But somehow I knew, somehow I knew that this amount of oil was not going to come from a small horn of oil or from a flask. This was a monumental amount of oil and it was noteworthy. As if what happened in the Old Testament wasn't noteworthy or significant because of the amount of oil. It, it's really astounding to me sometimes when I read some of the things I wrote. So then I go on to have a heading called, An Oil Spill Changes Things. We all have seen what a natural oil spill can do to an environment, the devastation it can bring, and the long-term effects years after the incident. Oil spills alter the landscape of an environment. Oil coats things, and it sits on the surface when mixed with water, changing anything it contacts even in the shallows. Oil kills things, and though much time is spent trying to clean up spills, the oil will still affect an environment for years to come. This oil spill that is coming in the spirit will devastate the kingdom of darkness. It is coming to change the landscape as we know it. The word of God tells us that his anointing destroys the yoke. And I referenced Isaiah 10, 27, which we will come back to that in just a moment. And that is what it intends to do. This oil spill is no accident, and though it is not man-made, the body of Christ is instrumental in the saturation that will invade every crevice of our being. It will coat everything it contacts, even those in the shallow waters. As the oil gets inside of us, his anointing will kill the things of the flesh that need to die so he may truly live within us. See what I mean about word salad? Word salad. To imply, you know, the other thing too is that that as the oil gets inside of us, that it will kill the things of the flesh so that he may truly live within us. This is not taking into account what Christ did on the cross, unfortunately. The enemy, I said, will scramble furiously to clean up this oil spill, but he will not succeed. He will attempt to diminish its power with a counterfeit move, but to no avail. He cannot subdue it, and its effects will be evident in generations. This is a fresh oil that is coming, and with it come new facets of his glory yet to be comprehended within us. Wow, I could be on prophecy bingo. I'm telling you what. The oil once poured out in times past has become comfortable because I define it as yesterday's oil becomes comfortable. And we have grown accustomed to certain ways God wants to move. But with this fresh oil coming forth, fresh facets of his presence will be released. We have to be willing to get uncomfortable and quit relying on the oil of yesterday to sustain us. The Lord has been doing tremendous things, but there is so much more he desires to reveal to us. This oil coming forth with such intensity is erupting from uncapped wells of his presence. It is coming forth from the flinty rocks in Christ, the ones from which his anointing and his living water flow. Where there is oil, fire can be sustained, and his anointing guarantees a constant flame within us. The oil is for consumption, his all-consuming fire. When that much anointing is present, this is not a controlled burn. His fire does not apologize nor seek permission to burn. It simply burns. Well... We must understand the gravity of this hour. We belong to a God who sets the moon and stars in place with his fingers. Psalm 8, 3. The physical size of his being is expansive. Imagine his horn of oil that is full and ready to be poured out on this earth. There is an oil spill coming, and it is coming to change our current spiritual landscape. What does that even mean? I mean, I look at, I have these moments where I, I read what I wrote in the past, and, and I just think, wow, that is not a prophetic word. This is so vague and generalized that means nothing i went on to say it will devastate the enemy's camp while enriching his bride making her fertile so she can produce for his kingdom while preparing for his return let us usher in his fresh oil let us be counted among the anointed ones standing by the lord of the whole earth because the anointed ones carry the fresh oil so this is making a distinction between it would seem between those that have the oil and don't have the oil those that are truly walking with the lord as far as um, in power and anointing versus those that are not. And so making the, these cat, this hierarchy really of, of Christianity. Uncap the oil wells assigned to you and usher in the oil spill in the spirit. Let us be that flinty rock striking ourselves against the word of God and igniting the oil that is to flow out from us. Yeah. Okay. I want to take a look at another article that I wrote uh, in April of 2017 that Charisma shared. And they titled it Prophetic Word. The Lord says, I am looking for lingerers. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but a good chunk of it, because I want you to hear it's related to this. That's why I pulled two of them today, because it's talking about the oil. And I did want to make a quick side note on the other one that I now find 
funny. I mean, I, I laugh. At, uh, I have to, I find humor in this because of the things I wrote, I do not believe that they're prophetic. I do not believe that they are from the Lord. I believe that they are from my own imagination and that they did not honor the Lord. They actually exalted me because of my perceived and, and, uh, professing way that I, I said, I heard from the Lord. It was interesting. I came across this about a year or so ago. I think it was, there was an article that a uh, pirate Christian actually did in February of 2017. So we're on the pirate website under the museum of idolatry. And you can see on February 17th of 2017, this was posted a transformational oil spill is coming says charisma magazine. And this was from me. So when you click on this link now, uh, it can no longer be found. The article can no longer be found, which that may have to do with the fact that where I had emailed the um, editor at the time and asked them to no longer share my posts. Now you can still find them on there, but that this link no longer works. Um, but they no longer share my new uh, post that I put out. But it says maybe Don Hill, who wrote this strange little article, went and saw Heidi Baker last year. Heidi Baker, I want to live an oily life. And they said, we here at Pirate Christian Media are ready for the oil spill. So I got a kick out of this, and I just wanted to share it um, because I thought it was funny. So anyway, the prophetic word, the other one was, I am looking for lingerers. And a lot of the stuff I had written down in my journals and when I, when I got them, and when I wrote the words down, I would put them into blog posts sometimes. So I shared this one on my blog and Charisma picked it up and shared it on uh, April 16th of 2017. But I was talking about hearing the voice of God that, that I claimed that the Lord said to me, I am looking for the lingerers. I am looking for those unconcerned with inconvenience. And when I say that the Lord was speaking to me, I believe that he was internally speaking to me and it sounded like my own voice. And we don't see that in scripture. I did not ever hear the audible voice of God. And so when I believe that God was speaking to me, it typically was in my own voice or I, I believe that whatever I was hearing internally was from God. And we just don't see that modeled in scripture. I said in this one that our pastor ministered that night with a message orchestrated by the Holy Spirit about the woman with the alabaster jar. And the Lord began to speak to me later about what it means to carry the anointing and talking about lingerers and the fragranced ones. And I said, I am reminded of people like Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus and chose the better portion rather than the busyness of life. I'm reminded of John the Beloved reclining onto the chest of Jesus, and I'm reminded of the woman who broke that alabaster vessel at the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. These people were lingerers, I said. They knew what it meant not to be in a hurry to leave the presence of God. They spent a long time over Jesus. They remain longer than necessary without concern of inconvenience. Now, I, I want to stop here for a second. I don't want to diminish our fellowship slash intimacy with Christ, our relationship with Christ. I do believe that we are to have a relationship with God. And as you heard Larry Sparks in the beginning, I, I think there is some truth to what he's saying that you don't want to just have head knowledge. There needs to be the transformation in your life. Unfortunately, what happens, though, I would say in this movement and having been part of it, and it's really all I knew for almost 20 years, was the thing of people saying or almost belittling um, theology, which is the study of God. And so, yes, there can be people that just have head knowledge of theology and they don't know God. But in order for you to know God, you need to, to have head knowledge and a heart transformation. But what happens in, in areas of this movement, I'm not going to say everybody in the, in the charismatic or hyper, I was more like I've said before in the hyper charismatic new apostolic reformation area. What you'll see is a major emphasis on you must feel something, experience something. If you're not doing something, which he talks about being stale, Larry Sparks mentioned this about being stoic or stale. If you're not going crazy in worship sometimes or praise and worship, if you're not lifting your hands, if you're not outwardly expressing something, then you're, then you really don't know the Lord. Not again, not everybody believes that, but there are people that do say that and do believe that. If you're not doing certain actions, then you really don't know the Lord. You're not truly fellowshipping with God or truly intimate with God. If you don't hear God's voice for yourself, then you really don't know God as you should. There's all these caveats that people will make, all these um, stipulations in order for you to prove that you have true fellowship with God. And I would say that that is problematic because um, there's, a, there's people that are stoic that they know God. 
and it's not just a head knowledge thing. It's it's their heart has been transformed. They don't have to go crazy in a in a praise and worship time of song in order to prove that. They don't have to hear the voice of God for themselves to prove that. What is demonstrated in their life is their private time they spend with God in his word, in prayer, in in how they interact with people, how they minister, taking time to minister the gospel, ministering to family, ministering to friends, how they conduct themselves, how they conduct themselves, not only, um, not in a perfect sense. When I say conduct, I mean, not only in how God has changed us, but also in the moments of understanding that we've been changed to recognize by the power of the Holy Spirit, when we are convicted by sin in our lives, that we come before the throne of grace And we recognize our need for Christ and we recognize the need for his intercession for us daily as the high priest. And we recognize that we've been saved by his grace and that we can come before the throne of grace and and receive his forgiveness and bear fruit in keeping with that, as I've talked about in other episodes. I wanted to mention that because, unfortunately, I think that that's something that, though it may have good intentions behind it when people say things like that, that, oh, you, you shouldn't just have head knowledge. Um, that you need to have a relationship. Well, yes, there's there's truth to that. But there's also concern with that when people say you just need to quit thinking. You you need to you need to stop because your analytical area of your your mind when you're using more of your mind and less of your heart that we can get in a really dangerous t- territory with that. And we need to understand that our heart can be deceived because of the things in the world because there's still that sinful nature there that can deceive that can try to override us and think well may, that's God speaking to us but it's not God speaking to us we're we're having vain imaginations and that's what I ascribe to much of what happened what I participated in for years is that that it was vain imaginations when it came to these types of writings. I went on to say that people are lingerers, as I talked about, and I asked the question, how long is too long to remain in his presence? If we desire to depart from his presence, then we have departed from the desire to know him, and our marriage to him is a sham. And I I find that a very sad commentary right there to say something like that, because our fellowship with God is not in these supernatural mystical experiences. It is also in the day-to-day normal things that we do. When I look at my own writing, I'm really bothered by the fact that I misappropriated scripture. I barely use scripture. And when I did, I misappropriated it. But I am appealing to my personal experience. And I'm saying that this is the Lord speaking. And this is the main focus. And this is where my argument comes from. When you claim, when you claim, when I claimed that God has spoken to you, that's authoritative. So people are obligated to listen when God speaks. We shouldn't diminish when someone says that and try to downplay it. I went on to say God is desiring those who will perpetually linger in his presence. We must understand that lingering is for the committed bride and it is not reserved for corporate gatherings. Lingerers refuse to disappear and they refuse to let their love die for Christ. They are always engaged with the king and because of their relationship with God, they become the fragranced ones. So this is where I went and talked about the aroma of Christ. And I said the intimacy with Christ leads to carrying his fragrance upon our lives. And I appeal to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And I, I do want to come back to that. So we're going to come back to two of these um, in Isaiah that I mentioned in the first one. And then 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 15, which I quoted it here, said, Now thanks be to God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ, and through us reveals the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God a sweet fragrance of Christ among those who are saved and among those who perish. And I said, we are called to spread the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Every time we choose to release the gospel for salvation, healing, deliverance, repentance, and more, we are breaking ourselves open like that alabaster jar, and we are releasing the aroma of Christ. We are spending ourselves to exalt him from time spent lingering with him. Now, I want to point out something here really quick. When I was rereading through this blog post, I noticed Every time we choose to release the gospel for salvation, healing, deliverance, repentance, and more, we are breaking ourselves open like that alabaster jar, and we are releasing the aroma of Christ. I hope that you notice that because I am lumping in into the gospel, healing, deliverance, repentance, and more. So I'm trying to show you right there that my beliefs at one point were similar to some of the people that I critique. Just wanted to point that out. 
I went on to say religion has this way of trying to do damage control when alabaster vessels are cracked open. Religious people refuse to linger because they carry dead men's bones. When they see lingerers in the anointing, they perceive a mess instead of discerning intimacy. What religion does not consider is that the fragrance follows the oil. We are called to carry his fragrance, and it begins with intimacy and a lifestyle of lingering in his midst. See, again, there's this distinction made between those that are truly are professing believers and, and we know that there are some people that are false converts and such, but just think about this for a moment. Those that are truly believers, they are saying they're calling for discernment of this. And those people like myself now are called religious people. This is the same thing that I did back then calling people. Well, you're just, you're just religious. You just don't have any oil. That's your problem. You don't have any oil. Oh, goodness. So I said, we are called to carry his fragrance. It has to do with intimacy and lingering in his midst and saying, you cannot release what you do not possess. That sure sounds like one of those isms that you would hear from some famous, well-known minister, doesn't it? You cannot release what you do not possess. And I ended with, I would rather be a broken vessel releasing the fragrance of Christ than a whitewashed tomb holding the stench of death. This world needs to encounter those who refuse to leave his presence and carry his aroma upon their lives. Well, that's deep. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about about the scriptures. And I also wanted to mention before I go into that, I mentioned how I wanted to touch on what Larry Sparks touched on and talked about. And I, I'm not going to play any more clips necessarily because he talked about the price to pay for fellowship. And the main thing that he focused on when he talked about the oil aspect was he talked about Matthew 25. And if you're familiar with that passage in the first several verses, that is the parable that Jesus gives about the 10 virgins and the lamps. And there's many people that have talked about this. So I'm not going to get into this in great detail, but I did want to touch on it just for a moment. The reason why I'm not going to go in great detail about it is because there's so much that can be talked about this particular passage. And there are debates between scholars as to who are the 10 virgins. There are some people that believe that this is referencing Israel in the context of what Jesus is saying and talking about Israel as far as the true believers full versus those that are unbelievers. And, and in saying that, the people that hold to that do not believe that Matthew 25 is talking about the church. You'll also see people that talk about that this is referring to uh, true versus false believers in general. And so there's a debate on this, and it also can be tied to uh, people's belief whether there is a rapture, uh, if this is pertaining to the millennial kingdom after the tribulation. So there's no way for me to get into that, but I did want to touch on that because this is a, an account that's used in order to talk about how you need the oil. And when you listen to Larry Sparks talk about this, and if you want to find the video and listen to it, again, the title of it is called uh, The Prophecy for 2023, A Year of Fire, Oil, and Awe. And that way you can listen to it for yourself and test it against scripture. But he talks about the oil and he says that he believes that this parable is, is in reference to 21st century believers that attend revival services and conferences and that they're just going to get a, an infilling at that point and that they need to go buy their own oil. And, you know, I would just say that um, it, it seems like there's a distinction. The oil is not the focus necessarily. The focus is on the coming of the bridegroom and the fact that both groups of, of virgins fell asleep, but one of them was prepared and one was not. And it does seem to show, in general, I would at least say, that there's a difference between those that truly are, are not only professing, but they are true believers in Christ, and those that are in profession in name only. And that they're not prepared. They're not, they don't truly belong to the Lord. So I would encourage you to do a study on that. Take a look at it for yourself. If you're interested, but know that this this particular account is used by many, even in the charismatic circles, to use it as a prophetic type teaching or language in order to demonstrate about us needing more oil and that we we need to be oily. I have, I heard that when I was in this movement that we need to be oily and uh, that we need to be saturated and that we need to be anointed, which I'll touch on that at the end. Um, because I think it's really encouraging for us as believers to have a, a, a better grasp on what that means to be anointed. And it's not just for a select chosen group that has special titles or 
self-appointed titles or anything like that. Now, I did want to talk about the first passage or verse that I even just mentioned, barely mentioned and cited in the first quote prophetic word that was shared in February of 2017 about the transformational oil spill. Um, I mentioned Isaiah 10, 27. And typically what I like to do is refer to other resources where people have done research or their Bible scholars to talk about this, maybe add a little bit of input, but really I like to refer to those because I think that that's more appropriate. So I found this article on Christianity.com and the question is answered, what does it mean the anointing breaks the yoke? This particular writer, his name's Mike Leake, he says he has some understanding of the original languages of scripture as he attended seminary. He is a pastor. And he talks about Isaiah 10, 27 and the reference to it. And he also mentions about the different translations of it. And um, he says, most agree that the first part of this verse is talking about a burden being lifted from their shoulder and a yoke from the neck. But the last part of the verse has many different translations. The NASB says because of fatness. The ESV said because of the fat. Um, the NIV says, because you have grown so fat, the KJV says, because of the anointing. And he goes on to talk about the context. And he says this in his article, before looking at the difficulty of this verse, it might be helpful to look at the overall context of Isaiah 10. In Isaiah 10, the Assyrians are a superpower that is threatening the people of Israel. The Assyrian kings would conquer a nation and then oppress the people. The people of Israel would eventually be overtaken by the Assyrians. But in this section of Isaiah 10, Mike points out, God is speaking to a remnant who will be rescued through this time of devastation. And as he goes on to talk about the meaning in this particular verse, he says, we know that it has to do with the rescue of God's people from the hand of the Assyrians. That much is clear. But what specifically does the anointing breaks the yoke mean? He says, one popular understanding of this verse is to say that the yoke is any particular bondage that a believer is experiencing, and the anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit. This verse, they would say, is telling us that the anointing of God is more powerful than any bondage you might be under. He says, here is how one particular teacher explained it. Isaiah 10, 27 defines the anointing as the heavy burden removing yoke destroying power of God. The anointing is what delivers God's people and sets the captives free. The anointing is literally God on flesh doing what flesh can't do. It is God's super added to our natural. Acts 10, 38 described the impact of the anointing on the life and ministry of Jesus. And this powerful verse reminds us that Jesus is a doer of good, that the affliction and sickness comes from the enemy, not God, and that the anointing is what removes the oppression. And now this is a quote that he's, he's referencing from someone that stated this. This is not what his belief is. He, he notes in this, there is a big problem with this interpretation. The word used here, which the KJV translates as anointing, isn't the typical Hebrew word used for anointing. And so he said the word typically used is Meshach. The word used in Isaiah 10, 10, 27, he points out is a different word. And he says the noun formed is used 87 times and is predominantly a reference to olive oil. He says, yes, this oil was used to anoint, but in those instances, it's typically anointing oil. He says the word can also mean fat. This is why some translations have gone for a translation like because you have grown so fat. If this is the correct translation, then he says it could mean something like this and he cites another commentary. Thus the yoke will be broken because of fatness simply means that wealthy Assyrians who have become fat will not get any fatter by their heavy taxation of Judah. In fact, their oppressive taxation will cause their downfall. And he uh, notes that others have taken this to be a reference to a certain blessing upon those who have been set apart or anointed. And it is saying that because of God's promise to David or Hezekiah or Israel, the yoke will eventually be broken. And in this same line of thought, it could be a reference to the Messiah. He said it's difficult to discern the precise meaning that he tends to think that it's something like the wound afflicted by the yoke will be healed through the application of oil seems to make the most sense. But the other meanings have some measure of plausibility as well. He says we cannot be certain, but the overall meaning is clear in the context of this passage that God will redeem and restore and he will break the yoke of Assyrian bondage. And so he goes on to talk about in this article and I'll post the link to it so you can read it. But he mentions about how do we apply this today? And so he elaborates on that some, though he, again, does not agree with what some of us have been um, accustomed to believing Isaiah 10, 27 means. But he does make this point, and I think this is a really good point that we need to focus on. And whenever we read scripture, we need to remember this, is that 
scripture is focused on Christ. It's focused on God and, and who he is and what he's done for his people. Yes, there are stories and accounts in there that tell of other people, but the focus always goes back to who God is, what he has done, and what Christ was going to do in the Old Testament and the fulfillment of what Christ did in the New Testament. And he makes this point at the end of this article. God can break any chain, even the powerful chain of the Assyrians. That's a pretty powerful message. And that was something that would have been encouragement to the Israelites in that time. So I would encourage you, you can look at that article for yourself. And I wanted to touch on that. The other verse I wanted to mention that I mentioned was 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And I'm going to read that again to you. Now, thanks be to God, Paul is writing this, who always causes us to triumph in Christ and through us reveals the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God a sweet fragrance of Christ among those who are saved and among those who perish. Now, when we think about what this is saying, it certainly doesn't allude to anything that I said about uh, God is looking for the lingerers. We must realize the context of what's being stated here. And we also need to realize that this is focused on Christ. This is focused on bringing him glory, not us. And it's not about us being so anointed that we carry some magical or mystical or powerful aroma to where we operate in this power to do things. And let me just say this. There are many people that, that would hold to this that, that sincerely want to please God and they want to glorify God in what they're doing. But they don't realize that this type of belief is really exalting man when when scripture is misappropriated and when it's believed that we have all this authority and all this power that we're walking in and that we need to be anointed in order to do all of these different things. And as believers, yes, we are anointed and we'll get there at the end. But when we talk about this particular passage, we need to look at what it is in context. And when Paul talks about this in Second Corinthians 2, the, the commentary that I see here for this, uh, I read this when he, Paul says, now thanks be to God. Um, this is noted in the MacArthur commentary. Paul made an abrupt transition from his narrative and looked above and beyond his troubles to praise and thank God by turning from the difficulties of ministry and focusing on the privileges of his position in Christ. Paul regained his joyful perspective and he notes that he picked up the narrative again in seven five. And when Paul says leads us in triumph in Christ, MacArthur notes, Paul drew from his imagery of the official and exalted Roman ceremony called the triumph. And there's several, I've looked in commentaries and other things, there's several people that note this. So I wanted to share this with you. That in the, in the time when Paul lived and when the, the, the Jewish people and the, and the Gentiles, the, the believers in Christ that lived in that time, they would have recognized this. That Rome had a ceremony called the Triumph. And this is where the victorious general was honored with a festive ceremonial parade through the streets of Rome. And the, the, the aroma that would have come from that would have been noticeable. It would have very much been on display in this Triumph. And MacArthur notes that first, Paul gave thanks for being led by a sovereign God at all times, and second, for the promised victory in Jesus Christ. And when it talks about the fragrance of his knowledge being diffused, Paul was also grateful, as it goes on to say here, for the privilege of being used as an influence for Christ wherever he went. The imagery comes from the strong, sweet smell of incense from censers in the triumph parade, which along with the fragrance of crushed flowers under the horse's hooves, produce a powerful aroma that filled the city. By this analogy, every believer is transformed and called by the Lord to be an influence for his gospel throughout the world. And so as we do this, when we carry the fragrance of Christ, we are to minister his gospel. And MacArthur says, as far as the, the fragrance of Christ is concerned, Paul was further thankful for the privilege of pleasing God. Continuing his analogy, Paul pictured God as the emperor at the end of the triumph, who also smells the pervasive fragrance and is pleased with the victorious efforts it represents. Wherever God's servant is faithful and, and is an influence for the gospel, God is pleased. Now, we recognize here that there are two distinctive people that, that will detect this aroma. He cites that in, in the verse that those will smell life to life and those that will smell um, life to death. That they will, the people that will reject it will, will smell death. It will be the aroma of death to them because they don't receive it. Whereas those believers who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior, they recognize their need for the gospel, their need for salvation. They smell from life to life. 
in the MacArthur commentary, it says Paul used the, the style of Hebrew superlatives to emphasize the twofold effect of gospel preaching. To some, the message brings eternal life and ultimate glorification. To others, it is a stumbling stone of offense that brings eternal death. No one in his own strength is adequate or competent to serve God in the ways and with the power that Paul has been describing. So I wanted to share that with you as far as that verse. And as I, I always do, I encourage you to do your own Bible study, to look at some of the meanings with this and to get a better understanding of that, because this is not a mystical meaning when, when we're, you know, God's looking for the lingerers and that you're to carry the fragrance of Christ and that you have an anointing and that you, you don't want to be your, like a religious person that's that's got just a whitewashed tomb with dead man's bones in it. This is actually making a distinction between believers and unbelievers. And those that, um, first of all, those of us who are in Christ, that we are, we are told to share the gospel. The gospel is what saves people. We don't save people. God saves people. And he's given us a means to share that with others. It's through his gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ through the scripture and testifying of Christ. And with that comes in this analogy of an aroma. For those that receive Christ, it brings eternal life. For those that reject, it just continues to perpetuate that death in them, that spiritual death, because they don't receive it. They don't acknowledge it. There's those two verses. Now, the one last thing I wanted to share with you today was um, some, some thoughts on what does it mean to have an anointing? What does it mean that we're anointed? Well, we don't need to seek out another man's anointing or to have it. We can't have it imparted to us or anything like that. And anybody who claims their own anointing, that's very problematic. I think the argument can be made that scripture points to things that allude to that, that indicate that that's problematic for someone to claim their own anointing and not understand that all believers are anointed. So there is this sense in which all of us as bel as believers, for those of us who are in Christ and have placed our faith in Christ, that we are all anointed. And through Jesus Christ, believers receive an anointing from the Holy One. And we can see this from 1 John 2, 20, when it says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. Prior to this, John is talking about the ones that went out, the many antichrists have come and that they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. So he reminds them in 1 John 2, 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. And so the Holy Spirit, as believers, he gives us knowledge to understand. The anointing is not expressed in an outward ceremony, but through sharing in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And at the moment of salvation, believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and joined to Christ, who is the anointed one, by the way. He is the anointed one. And as a result of this, we partake of his anointing. And we can see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. And also, I'll point you to 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, where, John, where the apostle John also reminds them, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you abide in him. So as believers, we have the anointing. Again, this is not something that you have to seek out from someone else that is super duper special. They're not that they're not more special than you as believers. And if they try to say that then there's a problem there because there's this understanding that again, that there's a hierarchy when there's no hierarchy, we all come to Christ at the same level in charismatic circles. You will see this type of, of talk about the anointing as we talked about and that we should seek it and that it's common for, for those that believe that to speak of anointed preachers and sermons as I've talked about. And that you need to seek the anointing, you need to unlock the anointing, you need to uncap your well, you need to walk in the anointing, you carry an anointing. Um, some people will seek out the anointing of or mantles of those that have passed on. They'll, they'll want something from them. We're never told to do that. What Christ gives us by his spirit is sufficient. It is sufficient <laughs> for you and sufficient for me as a believer in Christ to walk in that anointing and to understand the, the word of God, to understand how to be led by his spirit. This, this is what we should be focusing on, not 
trying to obtain something that scripture never tells us to try to obtain and to seek after. And we can also see that um, there are claims of corporate anointings as well as various types of individual anointings. I've sat under the teaching for years about uh, Aaron's beard and about how the oil flows down from the book of Psalms. And um, there were times that those passages were alluded to that when you're sitting under an apostle, under a leader, that the anointing flows down, f flows from the head down, that it flows down and it, it can be imparted to you. And so you can um, minister in the similar capacity with the same power and authority as the, the person that you're under, the leader that you're under. Where is that taught in scripture? We don't see that taught as far as that that's concerned in that capacity. Again, the anointing that Jesus gives by his spirit is sufficient. And it's for all believers, not just a select few and, and the special chosen, the, the, those that believe that they're the chosen people, the, the chosen ones to walk in it. The fivefold anointing, you know, the apostolic anointing, uh, the Deborah anointing, the Ruth anointing, the Esther anointing, all these different anointings. We're never told again. We're never told that those exist in scripture or that we are to seek after them. You'll hear people see, speak about those things. I'm sure if, if you've been a, affiliated with these types of movements, you've heard that uh, the special anointings that are, that are allowed by people, they'll say to use spiritual gifts to a higher degree. These things are espoused, but we can be confident that the Bible points to one anointing of the spirit, just as it points to one baptism. And again, we can refer to 1 John 2, 27 and also 2 Timothy 1, 14. And, and we can understand that uh, Satan cannot steal the anointing. And, and that's also talked about, too, in these circles, is that Satan can steal the anointing. Well, we don't need to worry about that as believers because Satan doesn't steal from God. Um, the, the anointing that God gives us by his spirit uh, we've been sealed with the promise for the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians talks about this. We don't need to worry about Satan stealing that. And this can go in different facets, as I've talked about before. But I think that we need to be content in what God has given us as believers in understanding that his word provides the, the answers to us, to our questions. And it provides the the foundation that we are to stand upon in knowing that we don't need these words I just read to you that I, that I wrote several years ago. You, these, this is not God speaking through these words. This is vain imagination. It's vain imagination. And notice how I barely even mentioned scripture in there. The focus, I'll say again, is on what revelation I claimed. How does that glorify God when his true word is made so little of, but these words are made so much of. And then it's focusing on, well, the Lord told me this, the Lord told me that, well, that's, that's authoritative and you need to listen to that. Otherwise, if you don't listen to it and it's God speaking, then you're disobeying. But I can't prove that God said this, but what I'm trying to do is barely cite scripture in there. And I didn't know this at the time when I was doing it again, sincere, but sincerely wrong. I was citing scripture barely in these essentially validate it. But it was not glorifying God. This is not glorifying God. What glorifies God is for us to understand scripture in context and for us to walk in God's ways, walk in the manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, to understand that the anointing that he gives by his spirit to teach us and to guide us and to lead us and to instruct us is sufficient. And that we don't need to be chasing after these other things or, you know, I, that I need to be focusing on how much I lay in the floor and how much I pray in tongues um, when, I when I was part of this and how much I lifted my hands and how much that I did all of these different things. Then it starts to become, it starts to venture into works plus, you know, um, if, if I do all of this, then I will be so anointed and so powerful and people will know that I have, I'm anointed to do A, B, C, D, and E rather than putting the focus back on Christ and what his word tells us to do and obeying God in what his word says to do and being led by his spirit and continue to be sanctified daily and being content in having that anointing and not trying to be the anointed one, <laughs> which that's very dangerous again, then you start crossing over into this boundary and wanting your own anointing. And that can, that's dangerous. So I don't know if this has been helpful or not, but I wanted to talk about this today and to highlight these, these particular ones 
and to discuss the anointing as far as our understanding of it and to help um, us to be encouraged by the word of God and knowing we are anointed because we're in Christ. He has anointed us and he has done that by his spirit and his spirit we know is is active in us. He is doing so much in the life of every born again believer and it's not found in these mystical experiences and what we feel and what we can try to tangibly see or t- what we ascribe to God that doesn't pass the test of scripture. What matters is, is that we are abiding in his word. We are abiding in Christ. We do certainly want to have fellowship slash intimacy with God. And we find that through reading his word, studying his word, praying, worshiping, being around other fellow believers, growing in that grace and knowledge to where there is that transformation in our life. And listen, you don't have to lift your hands to prove that any of that. You don't have to jump, holler, hoot, and shout. You don't have to do that to prove that. And if you do, that's works-based. Your life is to show the, the transformation that can only come through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because you've placed your faith in Christ to save you and to change you because you recognized you, that you were a sinner and your need for the Savior and that you recognize your need for him every day to can be conformed to the image of Christ by his spirit. You, know, you don't need to seek after this stuff, y'all. Stay in the word, abide in his word, grow in that fellowship with him in your private time through prayer, through praise and worship. It, it may look like in times of you lifting your hands and thanking God, and it may be in those times that you don't lift your hands. That doesn't mean anything. That's not the barometer of you having an anointing. Someone else laying their hands on you is not the bar- and that that alleges to have this massive anointing is not the barometer of you being anointed. If it's focused on man, it's wrong. And even when people say it's not focused on man, it can be. Because they'll pay lip service to God, but they'll still focus. Look how anointed I am. Look how many prophecies I got right. Look how long I laid in the floor. Look how long I worshiped. You know, that was, I I won't get on my soapbox on this, but that was another thing too, is I used to post pictures of myself worshiping, laying prostrate in the floor, things. And there's nothing wrong with those pictures. But when that becomes your barometer of showing how anointed you are in showing other people, oh, look how much I worship. Look how much I lift my hands. Look how much I do this. And look how anointed I am and how amazing I am because of God. Then who's being worshiped and who's being exalted there and whose anointing, quote, anointing is being highlighted. That's something that brought great conviction to me is that I don't need anybody to see how I worship the Lord. I don't need anybody to see how I read my Bible. I don't need anybody to see that. The only one that needs to to know that and to see that is, is the Lord. And he knows who is his and who isn't. And he knows who's been sealed by his Holy Spirit and, and who hasn't. And he knows who is anointed by him and who's not because of his spirit. Our job, our commission by Christ is to go and to make disciples, to go and minister the gospel. And when we do that, then we carry the aroma of Christ wherever we go, like Paul talked about. Not in a mystical way, not in some weird way, uh, Gnostic way, but we do it in ministering the gospel to those that, uh, to, that we come in contact with. And sharing that and, and metaphorically releasing that aroma of Christ to those that are perishing and to those that are in him that need that are encouraged and those that come to saving faith in Christ when we share that that's what we need to be focusing on it needs to be Christ focused and Christ centered anything other than that does not bring him glory and with that I'm going to stop cuz I am going to get on a soapbox <laughs> if I didn't already so I hope that that's helped you today I hope that you will go back to the word of God as always and stand on that as your foundation If you've enjoyed this podcast today, I hope that you'll consider leaving a five-star review. And if you want to reach out to me, you can feel free to do so at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. And I look forward to being on here with you again as we look at another topic. And we are growing in our grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesubscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesubscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. 
I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.